Would you mind to stand and sing together? Come now, it's a time to worship. to make. I first of all want to welcome our visitors. So glad that you're here and part of our church service today. And uh, thank you for coming. And we want to make note of your being here. Back on the back table, right outside the door, is a visitor's card. If you take that, fill it out and give it to me. You'll find me in the foyer at the close of the service. And give it to me. I would appreciate that. We have record of your being here. So we do have a few announcements to give to your attention. Um, I would like to ask if uh, Dr. Rajan, if you could start making your way forward. Um, next Sabbath is going to be a special Sabbath. It's going to be uh, with our Sabbath school programs, giving music during the church service. And I know you won't want to miss that. It will be a great uh, event. Also coming up here very shortly, and this was kind of a, a late notice for it to uh, work out, but we have camp meeting this year. And uh, camp meeting, it, uh, last year it was uh, put off because of COVID, and this year it's late and later than the normal time we have camp meeting, and so look in the bulletin for the announcements on that. Uh, Dr. Rajan, if you want to come forward. But anyways, we'll, we'll get that fixed. Uh, I'm here to make an announcement today for health ministry, and um, if you look in your bulletin, today at 6 p.m., uh, we're, um, uh, we'd like to invite you to join us on Zoom. Uh, we put the Zoom link uh, in the bulletin. Uh, there's the meeting ID and the passcode that you need to log in. Uh, it's going to be talking about men's health and uh, we're going to focus on um, a healthy life and uh, some preventive measures that you can carry the information when you go and see your physician and talk to your doctors about your issues. So join us, we have two, um, there are three speakers. Um, I'll be one moderator and Dr. Mark Scott and Dr. Mark Scherz from the uh, Institute of Hospital and Finance as well. So we we'll hope to see you all this afternoon at 6 p.m. Thank you. In September, we have a nice event planned out from Health Ministry. We have uh, this, uh, his name is Dr. Noah Chenaya. He's a professor at the University of North Dakota. He's a cardiologist. Um, he's an Adventist uh, that went to a school in India from CMC Valor, which is like the Harvard of um, uh, medical schools in India. He's coming to speak to us. He does health ministry all over the country. He goes to Canada and the United States. He has a very busy schedule. 
Uh, so we have something planned out. We're going to be talking about how to cure cancer and how to deal, um, how spices, people take a lot of spices and he's one of the specialists on spices and how that affects your body. Uh, it's going to be on September 17th, 18th and 19th. It's a, a whole weekend thing, so plan to be here. He's also gotten into a lot of gospel music and he has made uh, albums and, and recorded um, nice music. So he's going to do us a small concert uh, Saturday afternoon uh, before we go into the health ministry talk. So please uh, pass the word out to your friends and family. It's on September 17th, 18th, and 19th. Thanks. All right, and a very special event that's coming to our church is Vacation Bible School, and Karen Frankie will come and share with us. All right, well, I'm starting to get really excited about Vacation Bible School. It might seem a long ways off to you, but you should have seen my living room this week. It was covered with these big animal posters that were being cut out and put on to cardboard and everything so we can decorate the stage. The Bible Buddies will be back, if you remember from Roar. Um, so those are in the process of getting, getting ready, and I've also been learning some great music. So do you guys have any kids out there? Are there any kids? Hmm, I see a couple. All right, are you guys planning on coming to Vacation Bible School? Oh, I hope so. It's gonna be so much fun. Get your parents to help you register. There are two ways you can register. The first way, out in the lobby, I have registration papers that you can fill out the old-fashioned way. If that's the easiest for you, that's great. There's pens back there. Um, fill it out and get it to me. Uh, the other way is to do it online. And in the bulletin, there is a link that you can go to. It's um, http colon backslash backslash bit.ly dot backslash VBS 2021 register. So um, you can use that link. Another way to find it is to go to the Facebook page. And if you go under events and you scroll down to the bottom of the Vacation Bible School one, you'll find that link and you can click there. If you are a teen volunteer wanting to register, um, there's a link for you there. If you're a child, your parents can go there and get you registered. But the most important thing of all is you don't want to miss it, August 2 through 6. Now, I also need some more parent helpers or adult helpers. You don't have to be a parent. Um, I need some more adult helpers. I need people to guide the children through the evening. I need um, just, just adults to help out in a variety of different ways. Please see me. There is also a paper in the back at the table, the VBS table, where you can sign up and let me know that you are a willing volunteer. And um, we'll see if we can get that arranged to let you come and join um, the fun at VBS as well. Thank you so much. And register today. There's so many exciting things going on this summer for young people. Um, you notice in the bulletin there's a note about uh, Camp Mohaven and the summer camps. I want to give a special thanks to Mark Sorokas because he's taking a whole van full of kids out there uh, tomorrow, helping out. And we have people in our church uh, that are willing to help out and make a difference in our young people's lives. And when you do that, you're investing in a good investment, the investment of our future the investment of our children and helping our children to see that people care and that makes a difference in their lives because they want to stay close to where people care because this world is not a caring place. And so it's so good to see so many events going on uh, in our church and outside of our church and look at the bulletin, there's good information. I want to ask uh, one more thing, Lee uh, Kirschbaum, to come forward and give us an update on our renovation. Well, this last week, the temperature has been a little cool outside, but, but it's not cool in here. You'll notice, maybe you can't notice, but last week our, uh, our uh, relief on our renovation debt increased by $12,000, yeah, $12,001. From just uh, just last week, so from last week we went to just under six thousand dollars the total giving so far in our project to finish our debt to just under seven thousand, and that leaves us with nine thousand two hundred eight dollars and four cents left to uh, to finish paying off our our renovation debt. So uh, we have we have gone a long ways from when we started out. You know, the, uh, the first month of, of April, 
we brought in about $1,900. And in the last two weeks, last week and the week before, we have brought in over $2,000 just in two weeks. So it's warming up. You can you can tell the the fire is getting uh, taller. So thank you for your 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 willingness to to uh, to help out in this project, and thank you for your your giving. And hopefully, in a few weeks, we can uh, blow the top off our thermometer. Thank you. And again, thank you for contributing to help to reduce our renovation debt. We are getting so close to being complete um, on uh, the things that we plan to do. And um, so thank you for staying with it and helping us to get that debt down to zero. It's time now for prayer and ask God's presence in our worship service today. Thank you, Father, for your love and your mercy, your kindness to us. Thank you that we could gather here today in this house of worship to honor you. We ask now for your Holy Spirit to bless us, encourage us, to fill us, to guide us. Lord, we need you. We need your presence. So bless in the music and the spoken word and the prayers and the events that we share from our church that will all honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, our first song is going to be 516, which says, All the way my Savior leads me. song is 306 which says draw me nearer
the Lord. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. So I, I read a verse from the book of 2 Corinthians 9 from 10 to 11. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So now is the time for worship in giving. So today, today's offerings goes towards the local judge budget. So we have uh, offering packets by on the exits so on the left on the right and at the back there so as you go out after the service you are going to leave your offerings on those particular sites thank you daddy yes son you know what when i grow up i want to be just like you. Really? Even though I can't always play with you? I'm gone a lot working, and sometimes I have to correct you. Oh, I know, but I also know that you love me. Sometimes you lift me high in the air, and it seems like you can fix anything. But best of all, you teach me about Jesus. I love you, Dad. I love you, too. Why don't you run along now? There's something I must do. Sure, Dad. Dear God, help me to be the kind of dad my son needs. Lift me up high when I'm down and fix the brokenness in my life. Help me to be more like you to be because like me. me. Let your love shine through me. Thank you. Amen. Hey, son, how about let's play some little catch? Kids, let's be thankful for our dads. And remember that you have a Heavenly Father that loves you so much. Right now, we need your help to honor the dads that are here today. And Kara's going to tell you just what we need or what you need to do. That's right. So as the puppet said, tomorrow is a very special day and we're going to honor our fathers. Our fathers have done so much for us, right? They've provided for us, they've helped us, and we've been blessed enough to have fathers who've brought us to church and to teach us about God. 
And so we want to use our time right now to say thank you to them. And we have a special little gift for them. It's a bookmark with some little treats that they might like. And so we need your help to pass them out. And then after we're done passing them out, we have a short uh, video presentation of pictures of some of the fathers in our church. So if I could have all the fathers either stand or raise your hand. of uh, kids, we have some um, gifts to give to the fathers, and I'd like you to pass them out to them. And once everyone has one, then you can go back to your seat, and we'll have our slide presentation. So right over here. So fathers, go ahead and stand or raise your hand. these days when uh, my cell phone rings and that call from India I'm getting kind of panic I don't want to pick up the phone my hands are sweating <laughs> because I don't know what kind of news they are going to pass it on to me a fear stuck in my heart I'm sweating all over because I know two of my cousins got affected uh, with this pandemic. But I remember the promise that is given in the Bible. In the book of Isaiah 54 verse 10, it says, for the mountains shall be depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that hath mercy on thee. The Lord is mercy on us. And also I remember the promise that is given in Psalm 34, 7, where it says, The angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him and delivers them. So whatever the fear that is, you know, flooding in our heart, let's come together, be an open book before our 
before our God. And keep all your problems, whatever it may be, the sickness or the financial problem or your family problem, whatever the issues may be, that we can put everything into the foot of cross. And I'm sure the Lord will take care and he will give us peace and strength to overcome. And also at this time, I got two prayer requests. One is uh, a friend of uh, Lynn Lee, Michael Wilson, who has diabetic, and uh, he's having a major surgery done this morning. Maybe as we are talking here, you know, the doctors may be working on him. Let's remember him in our prayer. And also, Chitra's dad back in India, he's uh, kind of sick. He's getting this uh, fever, eye fever. The doctors were not able to diagnose what causes the problem. So let's remember him also in our prayer. So the congregation requested to kneel as far as possible as I seek the Lord in prayer. Gracious and merciful Father in heaven, Lord, we are so thankful to thee for bringing all of us into this beautiful sanctuary to sing songs and bring honor and glory to your name, Father. Father, I know that you are the fountain for all our blessings that we are enjoying day by day. For the good health and strength that you are giving to us, Father. Father, I'm also thankful to thee that the pandemic in our country is walking out at the door. We are thankful to thee. But I know, Father, other parts of the world, people are still suffering with this disease. The doctors are still unable to find the cause, what causes the fever. Lord, I know you are the great physician that the world had to see, Father. Father, you can diagnose everything and bring a comfort healing and a peace to the members of the family. Lord, once again, I place Michael and Chitra's dad in your hand. Be very close to them, Father. Give them the courage and the comfort they need to go as they go through this illness. I also think of the people, those who are sick back in India, in the hospitals. They are fighting, not getting enough oxygen still. Father, I place those people in your hand and please take care of them also. Once again, Father, I pray for our church pastor as he brings the message to us. We pray thee to anoint him and speak through him so that we can be able to understand your love and your mercy and your grace for us, Father. Father, once again, I commit all of us into thy care and keeping hands, Father. We have committed sin knowingly and unknowingly, Father, we pray thee that you will forgive us and you will wash us with the blood of thy son, Jesus Christ, and make us whole. And finally, when thou comes in the clouds of heaven, Father, maybe you all will have a place 
to go with thee to that home that you are preparing for us. To this end, I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. Hey, we acknowledged fathers, and there are many fathers that are biological fathers, and there are fathers that are uh, fathers because they have extended themselves to be a blessing uh, to uh, people around them, especially children and young people. And that's so important. Children need men, good Christian men in their lives. They need men that will stand up and will help them to understand the challenges before them and to be with them through their difficult times. And that means an investment in young people, taking time to get to know them, to hear them, to understand their needs, and to care for them. And uh, so uh, thank you, men, for the work that you have done and then will do. And uh, with special attention to your young people who need uh, father's influence so much. Something very special is the marking this day. Uh, it's a first for our nation, and it's been long overdue. And that's Juneteenth. Is, is that this is a national holiday, a holiday to recognize the end of slavery. And to think that it's taken so long to get here, but it's something that should have been acknowledged a long time ago and celebrated a long time ago. And I am so thankful that uh, there is a building of relationships of all colors that is going on. There's challenges that we have, there's no doubt. There are issues that need to be dealt with. But I am so thankful that we are moving in the right direction and there are good things that are going on because we are all together brothers and sisters in Christ. We all come from the original same parents. We all have a need to support and encourage one another because we're in a battle, and the battle for our lives and our souls, and so we need one another. And so I celebrate Juneteenth, uh, June 19th today, and I know it's a national holiday now, officially, and I'm grateful for that. And let us do all we can to build relationships and not have separation in our relationships. I think it's so evident in our church to see multi-ethnic backgrounds here, and it is just a blessing to me to get to know people from all different uh, uh, countries of the world and the cultures and the backgrounds that you bring. It is, it is really cool. All right, today we continue on with our series on the Chronicles of the Kingdom, and we're going to be talking about a central core understanding of Christianity today. And I'm sure you've noticed over and over again as Jesus walked this earth, when Jesus got near people, the common everyday type of people, he was very patient and kind, understanding, but when he got near the religious people, he became very direct with them. He didn't mince words. He shared what needed to be shared because there was a cancer that was working inside of them that he had to address. You also probably noticed over and over again, on the other hand, the religious leaders were the ones who were always mad and mean and antagonistic towards Jesus. But the common people were always captivated by Jesus' words and miracles and disposition. And so the main point of this message today is to see and understand the central core of Christianity, the heart of Christ, and what he has for us, his people, and you've got to see it from the eyes of the kingdom of God. You see, it's something very different than from what religious leaders have been teaching and many religious leaders teach today. Because they look at systems, they look at uh, groupings, they look at uh, structures, and they make those things the most important thing. But as I read my Bible, there's nothing more important than Christ. And to keep our focus on Him, and to give glory and honor to Him, 
and I've said this before and I'll say it again, our church has a distinct message for this world, a very clear message for this world, but this church cannot save me. It's only Jesus Christ that can save me. And as I trust in him, he will put things in order. He will put things in the right place and the right uh, time and work. So you may think it's simple to distinguish. You may think that you already understand the differences from back then and the religious uh, leaders back then. But I would say that even today, this is so ingrained in our thinking that we really need to dig deep to get it. We need to dig deep to realize the impact of it and to really see it. And so that's what we're looking at. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. And we're in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus has just finished the Beatitudes, but now he's moving on. And there's some important and powerful words that he has to share. You are the salt of the earth, he says. But if salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. Now, when I've read that in this translation, New American Standard, I think, what a foolish thing to do. I'll burn up the basket, right? But in, in other translations, New International Version, it says uh, a bowl. So that gives me a little more comfort. They're not going to burn the house down. But anyway, people don't put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke, of the, uh, stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished and people put different definitions on when that all is but I say it's at the end of all things whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven and whoever keeps and teaches them he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven for I say to you that unless your righteousness and this is a real zinger when you think about what Jesus was saying to the people in his time, it says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter into heaven. So, pretty amazing statement there. The influence of the scribes and the Pharisees were powerful, a powerful force in the life of the Jewish people. They were the main voice of who God was and how people were to view God but as you know as I know they got it all wrong and when Jesus comes along he turns their basic teachings up on in and they weren't happy about it I want to think about the scribes and the Pharisees for a moment as I mentioned a few weeks ago the Pharisees were very serious about studying all the works of the Bible in fact, so much so, they made it a practice to memorize most all of the Old Testament. Now, that's a formidable job. To memorize all of the Old Testament is huge. They were serious about what they did. And then they made elaborate commentaries called the Mishnah and the Talmud to interpret the Bible. In the Mishnah, it had 613 different laws used to give practical understanding to the people on how to live out the teachings of the Bible in their daily lives. They were diligent in their trade and centered their lives around their teachings. They had positive laws and they had negative laws, things that you had to do, things that you couldn't do, and things that you were supposed to avoid and with heavy emphasis on the last two of those, things you couldn't do and 
things you were supposed to avoid. And so they spent all their time working on these laws. It was a center of their world, and it was a center of the world of the Jewish people because the Jews were the chosen nation of God, and here were the leaders and the people needed a voice from God. And so these leaders gave voice, except the voice they gave was not the correct voice. With all their studying and all their background, they missed the mark. And that ought to tell us something. That ought to give us a warning. Just because we're in the Word doesn't mean that we really have got it. We need to really be in relationship with the Father. We need to be in relationship with the Son and the Holy Spirit to really get what the Word says and to apply it to our lives. And then we check and counter check and work it back and forth because if we miss this thing, we've missed everything. So the scribes and Pharisees were the primary source of understanding for the Jewish people on what the Word of God was all about. But again, when Jesus came along, he had a way of throwing all their teachings up on end and sharing Scripture from a, a totally different view. For example, when Jesus came along and said in verse 20, For I say to you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus said those words, he knew that everybody must have just been utterly, incredibly amazed and dumbfounded. Because the Pharisees and the teachers of the law basically lived in full-time obedience to their interpretation of Scripture. That was their job. How then in the world could the common people ever begin to hope to have a righteousness that exceeded the Pharisees? These were godly people. These were pious people. These were holy people, at least in their estimation of them. But as we find out through the life of Christ, as he walked among men, as he talked with people, as he totally flipped their thinking. I wonder how many today still carry that mindset where we think we need to have a kind of Pharisaical righteousness. Is that something that you struggle with? You know, it's something I struggle with because I recognize the value of the teaching of the Word and sometimes, you know, you wrestle it out and you, you say, this is right and this needs to happen and this needs to take place and so forth. And we don't see and recognize the grace part and evaluate, evaluate the grace and how it affects and puts them to perspective all these things. Could it be that we've hung on too much of the pharisaical way of seeking, seeing scripture and not enough of, of Jesus where he's leading um, today in the truths of God's word? The key is Jesus says if you want to be in the kingdom of heaven there's a gospel centeredness and I'm going to use that term gospel centeredness that is wholly different from pharisaical righteousness. So those term, two terms are going to play back and forth. And so let's jump into our text in Matthew 5 and verse 14. It gives us words here, and we are very familiar with these words. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket but put it on a lampstand and gives and it gives light to all who are in the house. Good illustration, very basic. Then he says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works in heaven and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So literally it says, you're the light of the world. Now notice there are two groups of people here practicing what they believe. One group it has their light under a basket. In other words, their light is only meant for a few. It is only for a specific group of people. It is an exclusive light. It is not welcome or available for others to share. Whereas the other group has their light on a lampstand, and in, in other words, it's open. It's inclusive for all people. It's meant for anyone who could benefit by it, and it is done in a way that is attractive to all people in general. And yes, even non-church people, even 
people of the world. And if you see this, if you can look in history and you look at people like Mother Teresa, who gave her life to minister to those who were dying, that it was attractive to so many people who didn't have anything to do with God, anything to do with uh, going to church, but they were attracted to seeing what she did because it was something so unusual to give selfless and wonderful uh, care for people. I need to stop right here for a second. I don't know if you are feeling warm, but I'm feeling pretty warm up here. And I know we have uh, some doors open for circulation of air. Could you allow me to turn up the AC just a second? It's right behind me. It'll just take a second to do it. Would that be okay? Okay. I'm going to give the second piece here too. Would you? Can I take off my jacket? <laughs> Good. I hope that helps. Okay, so going on with this, the first difference between gospel-centeredness and pharisaical righteousness, the first way for you to be able to tell the difference is how each group relates to people, their relationship with others, how they connect with others. Gospel-centered people are attracted to and attractive to people who they may not agree with. People who don't live the way that they do. People who don't believe what they believe. But pharisaical righteousness, people are turned off by, and they are very, very alienating to people who are different and disagree with them. God's work is to be inclusive, not exclusive. God's design is, is that we're here to help one another and to bless one another. Not to stand off and say, I'm better than you. Because as soon as we do that, we don't know who God is. Because God is not like that. We're here to build relationships and to cross boundaries. To connect with hearts and lives and people. And to make a difference in their lives. Now let's look at 5 and verse 13. Go back a text. It says, you are the salt of the earth. Well, what is salt? Back in those days, the main thing salt did, it was a preservative. You put salt on meat because before refrigeration, meat would go bad without the preservative. It would decay unless you put salt on it. What this is telling us is that God-centered people, gospel-centered people, by the nature of their walk with Christ, when they see things falling apart, they get in there. When they see somebody emotionally falling apart, emotionally upside down, they reach out to connect. And when they see a neighborhood socially or economically falling apart, they go in. Gospel-centered people care and with deeds of love and mercy are a part of who they are, what makes them up, because they are interested in people, their hearts are in compassion to people and their suffering and their difficulty. Just as we would want somebody to be compassionate when we suffer, when we have difficulties, when we have challenges. Whereas the pharisaical righteous people, however, don't have preservative qualities. Their salt has lost its saltiness. They really just want to stick together with their own kind. They don't like being out there where all the other people are who are different. They're not all attracted to neighborhoods that are falling apart. They could care less about people who are struggling in life. They look around and are careful to walk where they won't get contaminated. And so that's the difference between pharisaical righteousness and gospel-centeredness. Not only that, gospel-centered Christians are not just attracted to, but they are attracted to people who disagree with them. I can discuss something with somebody and have a disagreement with them, but I don't have to be argumentative. I can disagree with somebody and share what my views are, but I don't have to um, be difficult. So only um, 
they only have the idea of helping to preserve people and to understand how that works. They, they work it in their life. But there's another job of salt, and salt does something to make food taste good, right? I don't know about you, I love corn on the cob, and if I eat corn on the cob and it doesn't have salt on it, it's just, I, I don't want to eat it. I really like to have some salt. And what do I say after I've had corn on the cob with salt on it? Do I say, Jan, boy, that was great salt? Or do I say, thank you for making such wonderful corn on the cob? Because the job of salt is not to make you think how great the salt is, but how great a thing it is by adding flavor to it. Are you in a Bible study group? Are you in that group uh, leading out in some fashion or form? If you're salt, people won't go away saying, boy, that person really knows their Bible. Oh, I just think the world of that person. It happens when they go away, a small group in which you've been salt, they go away and saying, what a great group. How we've seen God working and blessing. So it's pretty simple. Salt gives flavor to life. In other words, gospel-centered Christians make you feel better. Pharisaical, righteous people always make you feel condemned. Make you feel bad. Have you ever had that happen to you? And I think we all have had that. In chapter 7, verse 1, there in Matthew, again, you can see right away... Jesus contrasting these two different styles. Jesus says, first of all, do not judge so that you will not be judged. Then he says, why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye and don't notice the log that is in your own eye? Jesus is saying, in essence, judging is making moral evaluations with superiority, and he's admonish, admonishing us not to be judgmental. So a gospel-centered Christian is someone who always sees their own sin as the plank and the sins of other people as the speck. Quite a different change here. Whereas pharisaical righteous people always see their own sins as the specks and everybody else as the log or the plank. That's the reason religious people always make you feel worse. They make you feel condemned. They leave a bad taste in your mouth. And so here's the difference. If you're a gospel-centered Christian, you never ever act or feel superior to anybody else, especially to people who are different than you. One of the things I found out when working with young people is, is that I talk to them as adults. I don't treat them with little kid things in mind. Appropriately, I work that. But if you reach them on a level that you're taking them serious, then they will respond seriously. The reason is, by the way, your attitude towards homeless and marginalized people is one of the best ways you could tell if you're a gospel-centered person um, a, a fair or a pharisaical person because when you look at these people from gospel-centered eyes you're going to see people whose lives are upside down who are poor and uneducated who are displaced and deeply struggling on the other hand that's when pharisaical people say why would you ever waste my time on people like that which shows that they have no saltiness Pharisaical people will judge people by their own level of righteous achievements, which of course their conclusion is, my sin is the speck and your sin is the log, so better brace up. Again, gospel-centered Christians aren't turned off by struggling people. In fact, there is compassion and care and action towards these people who are less fortunate. I came across a story this last week and that really it just touched my heart. As a family of six children, two of those children are their own, the other four are adopted. Each of those children have disabilities and challenges. 
One day, the man's wife came and she felt the conviction. She heard about a little girl in China, who's five years old and blind from birth. And she felt convicted that they needed to, uh, to adopt this child. And she wrestled with it, she struggled with it, and she wanted to make sure before mentioning to anybody else, especially her husband, that this is something that God had in store. This is what is a God thing. And so she hesitated and hesitated and finally one day made an appointment for, to meet him for lunch and then afterwards she had to take some of these kids, children of her, to therapy. When she did that, she had the hardest time presenting what she was going to present. So she skirted the issue, she didn't talk about it, she didn't talk about it, and she only had 10 minutes left before she had to leave. And so what she did had a picture of this little child and pushed it across the table. And her husband looks at it, at the picture, and he hesitates. He says, we can't do this. He knew what she was up to. He said, we can't do this. We are, we are just so maxed right now. I don't know how in the world we can do this. And she said, all I want you to do is pray about it. And so he prayed, he wrestled with it, and then for several days, and finally he came to her, and it, it was a conversation he had with his daughter, the oldest daughter that was his child. And she said, Dad, I want you to think about something. Is this little five-year-old blind child going to be better off in the orphanage where they are at, or better off with us? And he said they just clicked in, and he knew that it was supposed to be. And so they made arrangement, and it takes several months if you're going to adopt a child from another country um, and to get all the paperwork cleared, all everything all working. And so finally came the day when they went to meet this child and to take that child as their own. When they saw the child, it. This child didn't look, she didn't look five years old. She looked like more like one year old or less. And she was in fetal position. And it was evident she was not cared for. She had some kind of moldy thing across her teeth. And she just it was weak and just would not just acknowledge anything around her. But when they saw her, their hearts went out to her. And, and both of them were burst out crying because they knew that this child now had a chance in life. They knew that this child was their child and they unreservedly took this child as their own. And their hearts were very tender towards God. And this is, this is a God thing. For people to do something like this, this is a God thing for this to take place. And it really impressed and touched my heart to hear about people like this. And I've known several people. I have friends that have adopted four kids from Uganda that were in the orphanage. And they, they, their lives have changed because of it. And so I know that there are families out there all around that have a special calling, have a special need, and they're doing their thing as they believe that God has led them to this. Now I want to go back to verse 20 where we were talking. And once again this text, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus didn't stop with that statement. He knew when he made the announcement there would be huge questions, but instead of giving a simple answer, he compounds the issue even further. Look what he says in verse 21 and following. He goes in kind of a cadence. You have heard, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you. You've heard, you shall not murder, but I say to you. 
You've heard that it said that you shall keep your promises and not lie, keep your oath. And he, so he's going through the Ten Commandments. In every case he says, you religious people are concerned with the external, but I'm concerned with the heart. You have the external and still your heart will be just like everybody else's in the world, but if your heart is connected to mine, then your heart and your external actions will be right. So here's what he does. He says, okay, let's take a look at murder. You've heard that it was said, you shall not murder. Pharisaical righteous people are concerned not only about, are, are, excuse me, are concerned about uh, not physically murdering somebody. But Jesus says, if in your heart you have ill will, if you despise people, if you think of people as fools, if you disdain them, if you are indifferent to them, you have as much killed them. You've committed murder. And that must have blown people away right there. Then he moves on to sex. Jesus says, you've heard that it said you shall not commit adultery. Now the Christian sex ethic is this, that there is not to be sex outside of marriage. And what Jesus is doing is showing you the truth about adulterous relationships. He says, when you have sex outside of marriage, what you're saying is, I want to have a physical, erotic relationship with you, but I don't want to give you my personal commitment. In other words, let's have an adulterous relationship, but I don't want to actually give myself to you in every other way. I don't want to get married to you. I don't want to give up my independence. I don't want to give up my options. I don't want to do that. And so Jesus is saying, when you seek or ask for adulterous relationships, but if you don't have the integrity or the guts to back it up with your personal commitment, in other words, if you're not willing to put your whole heart there, he says simply, this is a lust issue. And when you do that, even if it's a fantasy, you're stabbing your own self in the heart. You're hurting your own self more than you realize. He goes on. He talks about speaking the truth. And he says, you've heard it said, if you take an oath, you better stick with the oath. Again, this is all the external part. And he says, in other words, you've signed a contract, and if you break the contract, the lawyers are going to come after you. But I say, this is what I'm telling you. Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. So what does he mean here? What he means is, your heart should be so full of integrity that everything that you say, Every yes, every no should be taken as serious by you as if you had just sworn on a stack of Bibles because external consequences mean nothing. To thine own self be true. By the time Jesus takes you through this whole section, you're kind of like a mass of smoldering wreckage because he basically obliterates any hope of righteousness that we have, any feelings that we are there, because he helps us to see deep down in our hearts and lives who we really are, and he helps us to see sin as we are sinners. You realize how impossible these requirements are. So what do we do with that? Where do we go with that? The answer is in verse 17, which is really the secret to the whole thing. He says there, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. That's the good news. What does Jesus mean when he says, I came to fulfill? Look at the Sermon on the Mount. First of all, he is the only one that has ever who has ever truly lived the Sermon on the Mount in its entirety. You go through the Sermon on the Mount and you're amazed at the beauty of the character of it all and it's all about Jesus. Jesus is the only person who has ever lived like this, but not only that, he didn't just fulfill the ser Sermon on the Mount, he has fulfilled the Beatitudes as well, and here's how he fulfilled them. 
Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. But Jesus, though he was merciful, did not obtain mercy. Rather, he was condemned. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Jesus, who was pure in heart, did not see God, but rather God turned his face away from him on the cross, and that's why he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus said, The meek will inherit the earth. He was perfectly meek, absolutely meek, but he was crucified, suspended between heaven and earth. And then Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. <laughs> Nobody hungered and thirsted after righteousness like Jesus, except he wasn't fulfilled. He was emptied out. He said, I thirst. He met all the requirements perfectly, but received none of the benefits. Though he was meek, he lost his inheritance. So you and I, though we are not meek, we can have his inheritance. Though he was pure in heart, he didn't see God. So you and I, who are not pure in heart, we can see God. Though he was merciful, he obtained no mercy. So you and I, who are not merciful, can obtain mercy. And Jesus says, I have fulfilled the Sermon on the Mount. I have utterly fulfilled it. Therefore, when you believe in me, not only does everything you deserve come unto me, but everything I've done comes to you. Which means God looks at you and he sees somebody who is beautiful, somebody who's living the Sermon on the Mount every day, and that's the higher view of the law. My hope is in Jesus. My hope is in Him. My life is bound in Him because I am not perfect. I, I don't meet the mark. And guess what? Neither do you. But in Jesus, we have life, eternal life. So Jesus is saying, I take the law more seriously than any religious piece, person because the other religious people say, do your best. And I say, no, and this is not you, about you. I say, no, keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes focused on me. Because otherwise you have to be absolutely perfect. And we don't measure up. Jesus has been perfected for us. In him, we have eternal life, and in him, we have life today. And it's not about our goodness. It's not about our ability to show how righteous we are. It's about him. Let's pray. Loving Lord and Savior, we come to you today and recognizing Lord, that as we are truthful with ourselves, we, boy, we fall short. And we like to think that we're doing pretty good. We like to think that, hey, uh, I've accomplished this and accomplished that. And there are things that truly we, uh, you know, have paid attention to and have done well with. But in the scheme of things, in the big picture, the only thing that really matters is that I'm in you, that we're in you, that we are found in you. Lord, we know that doesn't give us license to just slough off and to take for granted, uh, just to do whatever we want to do, because that's not taking you seriously. But we do take you seriously. And we want to live a life to honor you because you have made a way for our salvation, not to get salvation, but because you have made a way for us. And as we're in you, we have the promise, the assurance, the blessing of eternal life. As we are in you, we get to live out your kingdom here this day, 
with you, with your leading, with your assurance, with your comfort. We know that we have forgiveness as we come to you and humbly confess our sins. We know we have a place with you in your kingdom because we're not depending on ourselves. We're depending on you. And so, Lord, today I pray for your spirit to draw us close to you, to see you, to let our view be of you and your amazing grace, your amazing love. And we give you the honor and glory in the wonderful, amazing name of Jesus, our Savior. Everybody said? Amen. So would you mind to stand up as we sing our closing hymn? presentation for Father's Day. We don't want you to miss it. I think it will be a blessing to all of us. So if we could pause on that, then I'll come up and have our closing prayer.
pray. So Lord, thank you for fathers. Thank you for your call to men to be courageous, to stand for what is good, what is right. I pray that you would give wisdom to every man here, that you would give patience and understanding, that you would bless in our families, that we may serve and love and with all our heart to honor you by giving to our children all that they need in order to equip them for life. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are, what you have done, because we know that all things are bound up in you, and we have life in you, we have hope in you, and courage to do the right thing, always. So bless us, encourage us, lead us. Thank you for this day that we can worship together. Thank you for your spirit, and now fulfill in us your plan and purpose. And may it be in your grace that we meet again next week and are blessed by you once more. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed, and if you would remember offering buckets by the door, God bless you. We'll see you next week.